It's a great question. Um, I had to think about it a little bit to, to try to, you know, crystallize what's going on because there's a lot going on. Probably the two biggest things that have happened in the last few years for specifically venous thromboembolism is patient awareness. For the longest time, uh, patients who had either a deep venous thrombosis or a pulmonary embolism, which is what venous thromboembolism is, uh, was underdiagnosed and undertreated. And I think the awareness is improved. I think we have pretty good what's called a PERT program, which is the programs that hospitals have for PEs. And we're a little bit lagging behind on the DVT side, but we're starting to have more awareness about DVT. So what that does is it diagnoses earlier a usually pretty healthy young patient who usually is able to have a lot of productive years who are no, not able to do it because they were not treated in time or appropriately. So that's one barrier that I think we're starting to cross. Obviously, there's more work to be done, but uh, that's, that's really great news. The second thing is we're going really through an endovascular revolution, especially on the venous side. For the longest time, we just worked on the arterial side, uh, stroke, myocardial infarction, arterial disease with uh, PAD, but acute limb ischemia, which is all on the arterial side. Really not much was developed or done on the venous side. And probably in the last really three to four years, there is really a revolution. And I say the word revolution because truly now there are devices that are made for the venous side, dedicated venous, venous devices, dedicated medical devices that allow us to remove clots or thrombectomy devices, to name a few, clot retriever, uh, flow retriever, clot hunter, uh, lightning that's made by Penumbra. So these devices weren't even available a few years ago. And there's now dedicated venous stents that allow us to not just remove the thrombus after thrombectomy, but actually put in a stent that's gonna work on the venous side, not just steal it from the arterial side and hope and pray that it's gonna make a difference to our patients. So I would say those are the two probably biggest things that are really new and, and, and very good developments on the venous side. One other one isn't specifically for venous, but I would say that now there's more options with anticoagulation, um, like Xeralto, like um, Apexaban, which is um, Eliquis, in addition to just warfarin or Coumadin, which is very hard for patients to take. There's a lot of uh, changes in their doses that need to be made, blood tests that need to be done. So these newer oral anticoagulants um, have really made a difference. So it's easier for patients to stay on the medication and take better care of themselves. So because it's, uh, we're, we, it's new, most of the venous side um, devices, the change in the management. So it used to be the standard management used to be put the patient on a blood thinner and there's really no advance. There's no advantage to doing a thrombectomy or removing, going in and removing the clot like you would in a stroke or a heart attack or a, you know an MI or a, on the arterial side. And as it took time, like if you go back and look at the past, it's been a journey even for the stroke neuro, neurointerventionalists, neurosurgeons, interventional cardiologists to come to the conclusion that, you know what, if we can safely take this clot out, these patients are gonna do better. So similarly on the venous side, we're now coming to terms with, it's just a little slower that Maybe removing thrombus is a good idea, provided you can do it in a low risk way and provided you do no harm to the patients. So these medical devices now are allowing us to actually do that. And we're in the phase of collecting data. So, you know, I have to answer this, this correctly because really there's no current data. There's no current huge studies that say, you know, this is the thing to do because we're figuring it out. We're in the middle of it right now. And five years from now, 10 years from now, it's gonna be in a textbook. It's gonna be an accepted study to say, hey, you know, this was looked at and this is what we did. There isn't that right now. So right now it's anecdotal experiences, it's single centers, it's us getting together and talking at conferences. But there is no question, the more clot you remove, the more thrombus you remove from a vessel, the less residual venous obstruction you have, patients tend to do better. They tend to live longer. They tend to have less post uh, thrombosis uh, problems. It's called post-thrombotic syndrome, so varicose veins, swollen legs, hyperpigmented ulcers. And sadly, there's really no good treatment for it once the clot becomes chronic. So you take a person, you put them on a blood thinner, the blood goes from acute to chronic, you don't treat them. Lifelong, now they have a problem 
with chronic leg edema, venous ulceration, varicose veins, and the risk of recurrent clots. So by removing the clot and not leaving the residual venous, venous obstruction in the form of clot, patients actually do much better. So these new devices are allowing us to now figure out all these new devices developments, it's becoming more uh, a, a, a safer thing to do. It may not be the standard of care yet because we don't have the information, but it's certainly exciting because we're heading in the right direction and we're going to be able to help a lot of patients this way. Yeah, we had to, you know, you, you, you go into medicine and I remember some of the earliest conversations we had, at least when I was thinking about medicine, uh, and why I should go into it. And one argument that almost everybody who was a doctor that I spoke to made was that, well, it's recession proof. You'll never be out of a job. You'll always have patients to take care of. You know, it's apart from, you know, the other really good reasons, but from a pure economics reason, it was a, it was a smart thing to do. And what nobody really said is it's not pandemic proof. You know, this pandemic really showed us that it can, things can shut down and things can shut down. And our patients still need care and they need access to us. And if something were to happen like this, there's, there's nothing you can do because we weren't really, we weren't ready to, to, to work in these conditions. So as a practice, I manage our practice and as, a, and as a managing partner, I'm thinking to myself, okay, so our elective surgeries just went away, which is the 60% of our volume. There's not that many patients coming into the emergency room, which is the other 40% of my volume. You know, what are we supposed to do? Now, we didn't really want to do a lot of places just shut down. They laid off people, they furloughed people, they just shut down. And ours is a really small three-person practice. We're all like family. You know, we're constantly talking about culture and how, you know, we're in it together and team building. And, um, you know, thank God for, the, for, for some of the stimulus package and some of the help that the government gave us, the PPP loan and stuff. But it's still, business wasn't as usual. Like there was no way you know, that 24 weeks or whatever it ended up being, you know, a lump sum cash amount was going to get us through it. We had to pivot. We had to do something different to survive that we were going to carry not only through the pandemic, not knowing how long it was going to last for, but, you know, how, how long these effects are going to be felt. So one of the first things we did was our electronic medical record, our EMR platform allowed us um, to go video visits. So Video visits became something that we very rapidly started offering all patients. So if they had any questions, we, we allowed video visits. Now, the problem with that is our patients are older. Um, a lot of, uh, you know, 70 and up patients who are not familiar with the internet and their phone and their video visits. So now we had to change and we said, we'll do telephone visits. And it allowed us again to have templates where we could get the notes in and we could document what we're doing and then send that information over to another specialist or their primary care or something so we could stay in touch. So we really took the time during the pandemic to build those blocks. We reached out to urgent care centers, immediate care centers, and we said, you know what, we're open. We're not laying anybody off. We're not furloughing anybody. We're open. We will see any patient you want us to see because healthcare was open. There was no reason for us to not come to work. So what we started doing is really looking at how do we make ourselves available? We opened up our vascular labs, which do Doppler studies and non-invasive studies. And they were having a hard time sending those patients to the hospital like they normally would, or to an outpatient clinic that's closed because they don't have staff. So we really made some new relationships during the pandemic that we did not have before that have continued to serve us. So despite now things going back to normal, because during a crunch, we were there for them, we have now become their lifeline for them to continue to send us vascular referrals. So at that time, we did it really for survival and to figure out how do we keep the staff busy? You know, everybody's got to be doing something. How do we take care of our patients? It turned out in retrospect to be one of the smartest things we had done because now we do both. Not only has our efficiency gone up, we're now able to see patients in person. In our downtime, we're seeing patients as video visits. So revenue is actually up 20 or 30% where we wouldn't have had access to any of that, those things um, in the past. So that's definitely one thing. The second thing we did is we worked on our culture. Our employees were nervous. All of us were nervous. No one really knew what we were going to do, how we were going to get through it. You know, your loved ones, you don't want to go to work and get yourself exposed and your family exposed to the pandemic. So I think we took some really good steps, in communication, talking to each other, checking the temperature, you know, the vaccines became available. Everybody 
you know, we, we, we made sure the hospital system gave all of our staff uh, the vaccines, even though we're not hospital employed. We just have had a lot of good relationships and we, we made sure everybody felt safe. Whoever wanted to take a vaccine anyway, got the vaccine. We followed all of the CDC guidelines. And those things have held us in good stead too, because even with the variants and people being introduced and less masking, you know, in general, people are going out. I feel like our staff is safer and feel better. And then the other thing we did is we really looked at our processes and tried to streamline as much as we could about where are we wasting time? Where are we wasting energy? Where are we wasting money? Let's get together, let's sit together and let's figure out how do we make ourselves really, really streamlined and effective? So we are really a patient focused practice right from the get go where you can sense our culture is about taking care of each other and taking care of the patients. And we put the patient first, a lot of communication, a lot of respect. And I think that's not something I would have paid attention to or done because I would be busy putting fires out and taking care of patients and try to, you know, really didn't spend a lot of time on our culture and our team. And I think the pandemic allowed us to do that, which has been phenomenal. We really, it's a fun place to work and it's even more fun now.